And we are live. Welcome, folks, to episode 3182 of the Survival Podcast. I'm calling today's episode a master class in status jujitsu. We'll talk about what that is in just a second. Let me just remind you straight out of the gate, uh, whether you're watching this in a video or listening to the audio, it will apply because sooner or later you'll run into videos of me or social media stuff for me online. I will never contact you in comments and try to get some sort of private chat going with you or anything like that. I'll never give out a WhatsApp number because I don't even use WhatsApp. Uh, I am not DMing you from a backup account on Instagram, and I'm certainly not asking you for personal information in a YouTube comment right down there at the below of the video. I don't do that, but lots of scam artists do it all the time, hence the banner and hence the disclaimer at the beginning, uh, because at least one person did get scammed, and I just don't want that to happen to you. There's lots of ways all these companies like Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, et cetera, could prevent this. They don't give two shits about you, so you need to care about yourself. With that, what we're going to talk about again, status jiu-jitsu. And I'll say about it here in the intro segment is that I actually realized when I put out this information, there were a few people that must not know me. They got the wrong idea about what status jiu-jitsu was. They thought about it was being about being a good statist. It's actually about being a good, you know, revolutionary against the state, but using the state's own rules their own parameters against them. It's about designing within and around and through. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And it is right in the wheelhouse of the show's catchphrase. If you're new here, living a better life. If times get tough or even if they don't, we're going to need to dig into that concept more because right now what I see people doing is they're so afraid of things that they're planning only for the tough times. And uh, you can have tough times and not tough times at the same time. That's another episode, maybe next week or something like that. But before we do, let's go ahead and hear from today's sponsors of the day. Uh, Up front, I have for you guys today a Kickstarter that Paul Wheaton is doing. And this thing has done amazing out of the gate. It's only been running two days. It's already funded 45 grand. They only needed eight to do the thing. The thing is a garden master class. I'm going to let Paul tell you about that in a second. But I got to tell you, Uh, Paul's done a lot of Kickstarters. I've always backed his Kickstarters. I've always talked about his Kickstarters. I'm excited about this one. I'm so excited. I personally pledged 400 bucks uh, in the the tiered pledge. But you know what? It doesn't have to cost you that much. In fact, it it can cost you very little. You can actually get a ton of stuff just by backing this Kickstarter for a buck. Anyway, let me let Paul tell you about this, and I'll come back, and we'll, uh, we'll go on from there. I'm Paul Wheaton, and this is my 12th Kickstarter. Decades ago, I took a Master Gardener course. It was really challenging. The next year, I took the Advanced course. Over the years, hundreds of Master Gardeners have given me the impression that the course I took was far richer than most Master Gardener courses. Eventually, I became keen on permaculture. I shared my new enthusiasm with my master gardener instructor. That's when she told me that she had interned with the great Masanobu Fukuoka. I already knew she used her market garden for rigorous scientific research on techniques beyond organic, with massive emphasis on insects and merged crops. She is expanding on the work of Fukuoka. All at the same time, she was teaching 17 years of Master Gardener courses, 40 years of several different market gardens, commercial food forests in many different climates, plus managing a 2,000 acre organic farm in Colorado. What if there could be a Master Gardener program, but replace all the stuff about pesticides with stuff about permaculture? Fukuoka, market gardening, commercial food forest care, and all the stuff that I think is really cool. After years of planning, Helen came to teach what I am now calling the Certified Garden Master Course. The class sold out. I think the videos uh, from this inaugural Garden Master Course are going to be awesome. and You'll learn a lot from them. I mean, the community here is great as well. Paul is really funny. He's also very knowledgeable. So there's like a lot of auxiliary learning to be done. There was this huge bonus that we got of having Alan Booker, who teaches 
the permaculture design course here at Wheaton Labs. You listen to Helen and it's obvious she has been doing hands-on in the field work and research for four decades. And I'm really glad that we had the forethought to record it. A resident video editor whipped up a sample of what a full length edit could be. Wow. What I'm trying to combine is practical experience and observational natural history and farming, my on-farm research, with understanding the traditional horticulture, agriculture, plant physiology, plant pathology, entomology, and soil science, and utilizing the newest ecological and organic agriculture research. So there's more information that I can pull into this garden master class. How do we create a vibrant, self-regenerating ecosystem in which the food is growing, and as a result, the food is super high quality and very good. And so my focus is entirely on organic methods, organic production, and even better for me, because this is my interest, ecological system approaches. So the big Kickstarter question is, are there enough people wanting video of the whole class to pay for the editing? So guys, anyway, like I said, I'm excited about this. You know, when you've done what I've done for so long, there's a point where you're like, I probably don't need to take another online course or something. I need to be providing them to people. I'm excited not just to see how this all plays out and not just for all the extra goodies that Paul's given away in this. Because if you do this in the next day or two, like, so I think it's Friday they expire. There's a, just a, a crap ton of free goodies. Um, I'm more excited about it personally just to get this instruction. I think Helen is an amazing instructor. And uh, I'm pretty excited about this. And I like switching the name from uh, Master Gardener to Garden Master because Master Gardener uh, is quite variable. You can get somebody that's full on organic or beyond organic, and you can get somebody that's all chem in those courses. Anyway, let's move on to today's subject, statist jujitsu and where I came up with the terminology. So it's actually a permaculture principle blended with a martial art. And uh, the root of jujitsu is judo. Now, there are some jujitsu people that get really upset when you compare the two. I guess they don't know the history of their own art. Jujitsu, specifically Brazilian jujitsu, has evolved far beyond the original Japanese judo, but it is where it came from. You can look it up if you don't believe me. And then we take the judo mindset, right? And we take the permaculture principle and we put them together. And just as we can take alternative uh, grappling techniques, et cetera, combine them with original judo and end up with jujitsu, we can end up with status jujitsu. In other words, fighting the state using these principles. So the primary principle is judo, of judo is if you have your leverage right and you have your art right, the hardest thing you can hit somebody with is the earth and you can actually use your opponent's strength against them. As in all things, including what we're talking about today, this use your opponent's strength against them stuff, well, that does have its limitations. And that means picking and choosing your battles and following the art of war. But the permaculture principle that goes along with this concept is very simply put, the problem is the solution. Now, whenever I say that, I often quote Jeff Lawton when he makes that statement is, but you better be careful. The problem can be the problem as well. You have to think about the way you're doing these things. So I'll give you an example when I get to one of the things we're going to talk about today as far as things. How do you get around the system or how do you work with the system? How do you just accept that the system to do what you want is there? You just have to follow it, even if maybe you don't like it. Maybe it's just the best way to go. When I talk to people who, for instance, are having arguments within a marital or romantic relationship, I'll often say, do you want to be right or do you want to be happy? Because I'll find that people will argue so much about whether or not they're right that they lose sight of the fact that their goal in that relationship should for both sides to be happy. And I think that we do this against the state as well. And it's dumb because the state is an inanimate organism, right? It's not biological, but it is an organism. 
So it doesn't yield. It doesn't care. It doesn't get its feelings hurt. It just does what it does. And we get all emotional about being right instead of figuring out how to be happy. So status jujitsu is how do I maneuver within these boundaries of the state using the state's own rule against itself, right? And at the same time, design my life in a way where I'm actually happy and I'm able to do what I want to do, or let's say 90% of what I want to do. One of the people that I, I, I kind of probed on social media, what do you want to do that you think you can't do? And I'll tell you exactly what it is later on in the episode, but they're the type of person they try to break it. Oh, you can't do everything because you know I can't own nuclear weapons, which wasn't what they asked for, but I'm just giving an example. Well, you know, most people will never do 90% of what they want to do. And if you took away the entire apparatus of the state, you gave them a clean slate to do whatever they want. There was no restrictions. They still wouldn't do 90% of what they want to do. They're basically talkers and excuse makers and bullshitters. Like doing the things you want actually at times is pretty difficult. It takes a lot of work. It takes commitment. And so to avoid the pain, they make an excuse. I can't work out because I hurt my knee. Well, maybe you should do upper body conditioning first. And maybe you should do very gentle uh, workouts with your legs so you can recondition your knee so you can work out a little bit stronger and harder. No, but I can't. Right. That's it's the same philosophy. So when somebody says, well, here's this thing you can't do. I think they're cherry picking because they're looking for an excuse. And so if we can get to 80, 90 percent of what we want to accomplish in our lives, we're generally ahead of like 99 percent of people, no matter what opportunities they had to achieve. So that's what this technique or this mind, I shouldn't call it a technique. It's more of a mindset is designed to do. It also has to relate in a way to a movie that's very, very famous. And unfortunately, I guess the, the last chapter and it went woke from what people tell me. I haven't seen it, so I don't know. The Matrix. But key in The Matrix is you have the machines and then you have the people that are not in The Matrix but can enter and exit The Matrix. And the people that are just in The Matrix unconsciously, they... They operate only within the realms of what the matrix has allowed for someone to sleep in the matrix, right? They have those rules that they must follow. And then the people that come into the matrix, they operate under the same rules that the machines operate under when they come in consciously aware of the fact that they're in the matrix. So you have to start looking at your world that way. You look around at the majority of people, people call them normies, right? They're asleep in the matrix. They don't know. And this is not putting them down. It's just where they are. Everybody that's awake was asleep, right? So you'd be putting yourself down in the past. But they are. They're asleep. They don't understand. Uh, Joe is saying they're NPCs, right? And and that's, I think that's actually a better explanation than the battery. Like, they're just non-player characters. And in this particular game where we've raised the stakes from go along to get along to fight back intelligently, right? So... Key to why, you know, Neo and, and Morpheus and all are able to fight the, the, the machine-generated holographic characters, whatever they are, right, the Agent Smiths of the world, is because they both have to live within the rules that were established within the Matrix for those that are aware they're in the Matrix. And that doesn't mean that the machines might not be more powerful in certain instances, but they all have whatever limitations were placed on the matrix itself. So the average person doesn't know the limits way up here. They think the limits here. So they stay there. But once you're aware, you still have that upward limit. This is how you can actually be a status jujitsu master. Since you understand the rules they wrote for themselves, because understand the vast majority of the rules and laws that are written are actually written to advantage the people that paid for those laws to be written, which are the rich people, the oligarchs, uh, the lobbyists, the giant corporations, and the government itself. One of the reasons there's so many loopholes, for instance, in the realm of real estate is go look at the primary holdings of most of the people in high government office. They all have lots of real estate using those. So they wrote that rule for themselves. In fact, some of the biggest loopholes in, in, in real estate, I should go into this someday, were written by a, a congressman. Uh, it was either Michigan or Wisconsin where this guy was from years and years ago specifically to advantage himself and everybody else signed on to because they're all like, I see what you did there. So by understanding that this was set up so that they could operate above the artificial limits, you can operate above the artificial limits. And then you use their own limitations against them. 
they create this little space that says, well, you can if you. So when you do, you do you. And then you're in your little protective bubble that they have to respect because it's their rule that they set. Does this always work? You're going to have the, please to explain how in episode 31, like, like at the sci-fi conventions, right? But what about that shit does not come without risk? But if you, if you use the mindset I'm talking about today, your risk of failure because you simply failed is way higher than your risk of failure because the state shut you down. And so what are you really afraid of when you make that objection? You're in the matrix. You choose to raise your level of ability within the matrix to, to what's possible or to remain at the level that you were given as, as possible. That's your choice. And uh, anyway, um, I just need a pause. Ring here just for a second, guys. Sorry about that. I'll edit that out in the audio. All right. So back to it. Uh, we need to think about something that that people forget all the time. And somebody brought it up when I asked for input yesterday, and I was really happy to see it. It shows that they're paying attention. And when I first put this up, you're really not probably going to recognize where I'm going with it at first. But if, if you had a good permaculture course, you should have at least seen this before. It's known as the scale of permanence with a slight modification by me. And the scale of permanence comes from Yeoman's key line uh, uh, design systems from uh, P.A. Yeoman's book, Water for Every Farm. And it really wasn't meant to be used the way that I'm using it today. But when permaculture teachers bring it in, they usually don't teach key line design. They use this as a way to teach permaculture as a over uh, larger overriding discipline. That's what I'm doing here. For those that can't see it, basically this is a graph and it says the farther we move to the right, the harder it is to change a thing and the more difficult and more energy it requires. So if we look on the scale of permanence from Yeoman, the easiest thing to change is soil, right? We think that's hard, but it's actually not. There's a, you know, a, a myriad of ways to change soil. We can use compost, nutrient amendments. We can use ruminants. We can use chickens. We can use plowing and tillage to establish perennials. There's so many ways that we can change that. The next thing is subdivision and fencing. Understand, subdivision here does not mean changing the layout of a subdivision that exists. It means on your land, how you subdivide and fence your own land. That's easy to change. You own it. You control it. Then structures. Structures are fairly permanent. It takes more energy and effort. If you really put a building in the wrong place, it takes more effort to change it. Trees. Trees are harder than structures. Trees take a long time to grow. Cutting down the tree has a big consequence. You have to wait a long time for it to be replaced, etc. Roads and access take even more energy. If you think about what kind of energy it takes to, uh, to put a road in or to maintain a road, if you put it in poorly, where water's sheeting across it instead of shedding off of it properly. Next up from there is water. Now, this is not rain. This is water, how water moves and flows on your land. But if you think about it, it's not e like everything up to this point, not even that hard to do because we can control water with ponds, pocket ponds, drive through ponds, swales, key line plowing, all types of ways we can have water spend more time on the property, take longer to get off. This is where it gets hard. I'm sticking with yeomans and stuff, what I've inserted, land shape. People think we're changing the shape of land by putting a swale in. No, we're not. We're just working within the shape of the land. If you have land that's steep, it's going to be steep. It almost doesn't even, like, more difficult. It, this almost should go to where it says, like, land shape should be nearly impossible. There are things that can be done. Coal companies remove the top of a mountain, for instance. But overall, the true form of land at scale is at the, the edge of almost impossible. And then we have climate. Now, climate... I'm not going to get into global warming or any of that crap today. We're not talking about that. We're not denying the existence of microclimate. But if you live in USDA zone 7B, you live in USDA zone 7B. If your average rainfall is 15 inches a year, your average rainfall is 15 inches a year. Whether it changes or not, your ability to change it is pretty much, it, it does not exist. OK, so when you're looking for a place to be as a permaculturist, you look at this, but we should use this in how we decide what we're going to do with our lives. So what we start out here is location, location, location. 
all right? We should always think about that first with decide what I want to do. And I already want to pick a place where that's easy to do or less restricted or unrestricted. And if we didn't do that, we might make a hard decision because part of scale of permanence is where you live. But changing it involves renting a moving truck and making new friends. But it's it's actually far more doable than the one that I've inserted. You guys in the in the video, right? You see what I've inserted. Those in the audio, you're finally going to get the drop of what it is. Right between water and land shape, I've added to this graph, government regulations go here. And I want you to think about it. I have a piece of land. Is it easier to get a law change that says I'm not allowed to do a thing or to, 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 to make my soil better? Okay. Is it easier to get the law changed or decide where I put my fencing for subdividing my own land? Way easier to change the law. Is it easier for me to, to move, alter, put up a structure than it is to alter government regulations? And literally the only thing in the way of that, other than the energy and cost, would be government regulations, like you need a permit. So the structure itself is pretty easy. Trees. Uh, we haven't gotten quite yet to where we need a permit to plant a tree. Roads and access. It's easier to take a D7 dozer and push a road in than it is to change a law. Water. Water relative as far as to how it interacts on our land landfall, especially if you the only real objection to this is going to be government regulation. So government regulations can be altered. They don't go to the level of impossible, okay? But they go to the level of edging on impossible. It would be much easier to find a place where you can legally have chickens, if that's what you want in your life, for instance, than to go to a place where you can have chickens and change the law. And, and then there's there's part of me that like, you know, you just, you, everybody should be able to have chickens. But what if, like, here, so here's the full-on libertarian in me, the full-on anarchist, volunteers. What if there's a community? And the reason that law exists is not just that it was put on the books in 1968 by a bunch of 1968 Karens. What if that community, by and large, like 80 to 90% of people that live in that community are like, we don't want chickens. Who should have to make the, who should have to make the decision to leave? Like, isn't there a place for self-determination? So I don't think that that's the case in most instances. I think in most instances, a lot of these laws that we have, if people actually understood what was being asked, they don't give two shits about it, right? But there's all it takes is a few loudmouth voices, and it's much easier to keep a law in place than to create a new law or repeal a law. In fact, in the scale of permanence of law, the most permanent thing is the already existing law. And the most energy required to change is an already existing law. And it takes more energy to repeal a law than pass a new law. So if we, if, we, if we factored that into our decisions early on, we start asking ourselves questions like not just where do we live, but how do we exist? So is the, is the position I want to take better that I am a corporation or a limited liability company or an individual? You might think it's always an LLC. But there might be some places, for instance, if you want to operate under the cottage food laws in a food business, you might be better off operating as an individual, maybe even in an individual employed by your own LLC. So it's not just where, but how we exist relative to the laws and restrictions of government around us, because it's very hard to pass a new law. It's very hard to repeal a law. And it's almost impossible to get rid of the full effects of an existing law without a lot of work. In fact, I would tell you, let's say that you had a neighbor that was causing a problem and you were rich. And you were like, I could make the neighbor's problem go away by lobbying government to make that problem where they're not allowed to cause me a problem anymore. Since energy is money, if you did the financial calculation, it would probably cost you less unless it was like they were the, the freaking Wild Ranch or something like that or the King's Ranch or something. Most of your neighbors, if they were a problem and you had lots of money, it would be easier just to, to go in and offer them enough money that they'll leave than to change the law. Once you start to see things this way, you start making completely different decisions about where you live and how you live when you exist there. Next, I want to tell you what kicked this off. So Brandon, and some people get upset when I say that, so the dementia patient that occupies the White House, a.k.a. President Biden, uh, his administration, because I don't think he personally has anything to do with this, uh, are floating the idea. So this has not been passed. It's not a law. It's a rule. So this is an example of 
there's a lot of stuff that if you're the president of the United States or your executive branch of state, county government, you can just decide that you've changed your mind about how you interpret the existing law. So it's easy for them to change it, right? That's one of their advantages of being in the machine, being one of the machines in the matrix. They have certain cheat codes that you don't have. So one of the things that has been the, the government's been at war with since the labor movement started in the 20s, but really ramped up after Obamacare passed, is the concept of contractors versus employees. This used to be really simple not that long ago. When we ran a construction company, everybody was a contractor until they were worthy of being made into an employee. And there was no trouble, no problems, nothing with it. And what that meant was like, you're responsible for your own taxes, including your own social security tax. So you might get paid more by the hour, right? And there's a lot of advantages of being a contractor. And depending on what you do, there's some disadvantages. Now, this rule is actually not much different than what was done in California. And it's already been circumvented in California by the gig industry. And everybody's pointing to the gig industry, the Uber, the Lyft, the Uber Eats, et cetera. But the reality is under the rules that, that, that they're bound to, it's very difficult to say that an Uber driver is not a contractor because an Uber driver is never told when they have to work. They turn the shit on and they work when they want to and they turn it off and don't. They have a tremendous amount of opportunity to control their own profit and loss. They have a tremendous amount of legitimate expenses against their profit. Like, So this is a much to do about nothing with the Uber Lyft, Uber Eats, Rovers, all those things. Those people are clearly not employees. And even if they decide that they are, because there's nothing that prevents liars from lying when they have power and using the lie and power. So let's say they even did this. My solution I'm about to give you would still work. And this is so simplistic that it's why I wanted to cover it with you today, because it's so easy to circumvent. It shows you how sometimes these problems that we think are huge, because where does government regulation and law go on a scale of permanence? Oh, up to almost impossible. So instead of removing it, we design around it. So here's what just completely destroys the narrative of this person is an employee versus a contractor. The person submitting a piece of paper and forming either something like an S Corp or an LLC, and then say they're doing business as a company. So now we have a corporate to corporate billing structure. So now I am Jack Uber Inc., Jack Uber LLC, Super Jack Uber LLC, whatever name's still available in the state of Texas, and I'm going to Uber. My corporation owns my vehicles, and I drive for my corporation. And the person that understands the way the state thinks is not wrong at first, until you think deeper, when they say, but they'll just say you're an employee of your own company. But all those laws, all those rules about being an employee of a company go away if you have ownership in the company. Minimum wage does not apply to somebody that is a partner owner in the company. Does not apply. The requirement to do just about anything goes completely away if you are an owner in the company. And specifically, it's completely annihilated if you have controlling interest because you can't possibly be doing something you don't want to do. Because you have, you know, veto power over everybody. So I'm going to explain something that should be obvious. If you are the sole owner of an LLC or an S Corp, you obviously have controlling interest over it. So this would be my plan because it's going to be smaller businesses that are employing legit. And, and let's be fair, though I don't like being fair with the state, but let's be fair. Anyway. There are employers that are treating contractors like employees. You will sit here from this hour to this hour. You will do this work. But like it's not a contract relationship in reality. Now, I think you should be able to do that because both parties agree. Yeah, but if you're circumventing this, this, this solution I'm going to give you may not work. If you're circumventing it blatantly in conflict with the intent of the law. But if what you're having is the state interfere with you because they want to, then this would be my plan. I would make every position that I hired partially a mentorship internship. You come to Jack Inc. not just for a job, but to be mentored and to be an intern and to learn to develop your business school skills in this world. Day one would be how you file for a limited liability company, 
is a limited liability company, right? For you as an escort, better for you, depending on what you're going to be doing when you're working with Jack Super Inc., what have you, uh, how to get a bank account for your corporation, uh, how to establish your own business, how to, how to file any forms that you need in the jurisdiction where they're in, whether it's a DBA form in addition to, because sometimes I know like it's an either or, you do a DBA or an LLC. Sometimes there's an advantage to not only filing your corporation, but locally a DBA. So then it'd be like, well, then you need to talk to a tax attorney. Here's our on-staff tax attorney, our tax attorney's on retainer for, for initiation days. Basically a blueprint kit, how to become U Inc or U L L C or U S Corp, right? Uh, day two forward, and it really might take a week for this to happen, but going forward, all business that we do together is corporate to corporate, and the federal government can shove their own head right up their own ass. And we're done. We're not talking about it. It's done. I've empowered you to be your own company, and I've given your company a contract with my company. We are done. We are not discussing this any further. The state, again, can shove its head up its own ass, goodbye, go out, because we use their rules to do this. Now, that means there might be a cost associated with filing. It's not a lot of money, though. If you're in California, this is going to be more difficult because they've artificially inflated the cost of doing this. Even if you file to be a non-state corporation, like filing as a Delaware or a Nevada corporation, California sucks. Let's go back. Location, location, location. My advice to you if you live in California, unless you can figure out how to do exactly what you want within this mindset of thinking, get the hell out. California has decided that it literally hates its citizens. They hate you and they want everything you have. Every state is a vampire. They're freaking Dracula and the original master uh, uh, vampire put together. I mean, that that's how, but that's up to you, right? But this is what I would do. And then I would provide an ongoing, right, advice and support, like how to find the right CPA, uh, how, to, how to set up your own retirement planning, all of that. It would make it actually an attraction to people to come work with me or for me. And I would want this because not only would it get around the state's bullshit, think about what I'm doing long term as a business person. I'm creating, hopefully over time, dozens, hundreds of business savvy individuals. Do you know what business savvy individuals do with each other? They don't really compete. They don't beat each other up unless you're stupid about how you handle it. If you do it right, then your people come back and they want to collaborate and cooperate. You're building your own army of independent business people. So this is an example of a full-on body slam to the ground face first of the state. If they implement this rule, any, there's nothing that prevents anybody out there hearing me from doing this. Again, where you live may increase the expense to the individual on the other end, or if you're you're stifling them, like because I might like if I if I'm willing to hire you with a long term relationship and planning, two hundred dollars in filing fees, I'm willing to like pay that to you, right? So that you can, and maybe that's part of your first week's pay where you're not doing much except learning, and you get paid minimum wage, and it covers everything as you get your kit set up and your your uh, your articles of incorporation filed and all that, your bank account. And then you go to work and the first and then it's basically you're, you you come to work as a part time temp and then you transition into a corporate to corporate relationship. Now, would I run this by a tax attorney and not just a tax attorney, but a corporate law attorney before I formalized the package and rolled it out? Yeah. But the thing is, if I did that, I would probably have a kit for anybody operating, at least in my state to do that with. And I'd probably make it open source. Just because I'm that big of a prick when it comes to fighting the state. So if you look at something like this, this seems like this insurmountable thing that the white, and I don't care if it's Brandon or anybody else, that the White House did. There's nothing that can be done. It's going to just, here's an answer from a redneck hippie duck farm. Because the thinking is the key here. So I'm going to go through some other examples today, but... It's always about having enough knowledge about their rules so that you can understand how to operate within the framework of the rules. Something we hear all the time, the tax code is needlessly complicated and unfair. Okay, why? Why is the tax code needlessly complicated and unfair? Who decided to write all this IRS code? Who decided 
to make the tax code as big as two, like the largest metropolitan yellow pages from the 1980s. Those are remember phone books, two of them. That's the tax code. That's what you, you know, you have to do. Who did that? Did we do that? Did we vote for that shit? No, of course not. How to get there? How does all that shit get there? Do congressmen sit down and dutifully write the bills? No. How does it happen? Corporations and rich people employ lobbyists who write legislation that benefits them. So when you look at it that way, and you do just even a cursory exam of what all that shit says in all those books, you realize something. Only about 5 to 10% is what you have to do. And about 90% of it is how you get out of doing the 10% that they say you have to do. That's valid. Now, if you are a W-2 employee, there are some things you can do about this, but you're pretty screwed overall. The ways you get out of it, you're pretty inherently limited in. But the minute you become U Inc., U LLC, U Corp., even with a side hustle, a whole new world opens up. Have you looked at what the mileage deduction is now? As long as you can legitimately explain how your tra your travel in your vehicle was for business, you can deduct that mileage. Why do you think they, every once in a while, the media comes out with, oh, my poor Uber drivers, my poor Lyft drivers, we did this result audit, and we found out they're all barely making any money. Really, then why are they doing it? Why are they doing it? See, the Uber driver is the epitome of, it is not how much you make, but how much you keep that matters. Let me say that again. That's so important. It is not how much money you make. It is how much money you keep that matters. So the average person earns, pays taxes, and spends or saves with less. When you move into the, the realm of being an entrepreneur, even on paper, as long as you're legitimate on paper and you're legitimate in what you're doing in an attempt to earn a profit, it's not just a bullshit fake thing that you can get caught for and put, put in freaking prison for. But legitimate entrepreneurship means you're pursuing a profit through a set of activities that fall within the rules of the matrix. You now move to a position where you earn, spend, and and spend and save, and then pay tax on the remainder. Now, can you 100% move your spending and saving into pre-tax? No. This is a game of percentile. And if you get a good CPA and you keep good records and you get informed to the things that are specific to you. This is something I've never said before, but it's really important to understand. You should work with your CPA the way you work with a good physician when you're treating a specific illness, right? So your doctor, if you have an, an oncologist, and you have a particular form of cancer, they will always know more about cancer than you, but they may not know more about your particular variety of cancer than you or the latest things going on or the nutritional support. Like there's so many things that just flatly will be more important to you than to your doctor. And if you have a good physician, when you bring this information to them, they'll say, you know, I know that sounds good, but this is fluffy, buddy bullshit. And it, I, I looked into it for you. I took it seriously, but it won't help you. Or, hey, you know what? This can't this can't hurt. Let's try it. Or this actually seems like something we should be doing. And you would be working as a team with your doctor. This is more true with a CPA. A CPA has a general broad knowledge of tax law. When you can find a thing, then you can say, hey, I think we can use this deduction that they've made available. And they should know the mo most new ones, the biggest impacting ones. But the other thing that the CPA really needs from you, every dollar you spend, you need to bring it to your CPA and go, can we make this an expense? And you, as you trust a good physician, you need to trust a good CPA. When they say, that's going to be a problem, you don't do it. But what you usually get is, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if we can do this or not. Let me check. And they'll say, well, if we call it this, and if this thing, I'm going to ask you a question. Is this true? Yes. Okay, then we can do it this way. Or they'll say, <clears throat> not all of it. But if you go back and make this structural adjustment, we can take 50% of this and we can deduct it. And this is how you actually start traveling that path. 
Do you understand that? This is how you start to travel that path. And just like any other path, you get better over time. You get better over time. And if you have a good team working for you, as in attorneys, CPAs, et cetera, they get better at managing your things over time. And as you get bigger and have more income, your team should grow. So you might have a very basic CPA when you're running a side hustle and netting 50 grand a year, right? But when you start building a business that's making like a multi-six-figure income, you probably need a, a better CPA or a tax attorney to go with that CPA. At least maybe having a tax attorney review what you're doing once a year. And that, that for some of you, that sounds so far away from where you ever think you're going to be. And that's okay. As long as you accept 100% right now, this moment, the only reason that's true is because you've chosen for it to be true. There's something in your life you could monetize to the extent of making it a business for profit. Here's another example of a rule people don't know. If you run a business, you have to make a profit within five years, or you end up having to pay tax on the revenue. They basically consider it hobby income without being able to deduct the expense anymore. It's a trap. Not if you dissolve the business and create a new business. Now, I'm going to say something that will shock some of you. I don't think you should ever have to do that. I think if you run a business for five years and even with taking full advantage of the tax code, you don't post something in profit, you suck at running that business and you should dissolve it and you should create a new business that actually makes a freaking profit. I don't want my businesses to lose money fully. If I have a, if I have a legitimate lost business, I have a parasite sucking at my very existence. I don't want this. I want a profitable business. But I also want to take advantage of all the things that let me take a lot of things and move them into the expense column. Just an example. Let's, let's move on from there. So when I put this on Twitter, I put this on several different things. So what? tell me what you want to do for tomorrow's episode. And I knew Twitter would be the freaking place where I would get that guy. He said, well, I want to own a machine gun and a suppressor and grenades. And I said, well, do you know how you own a machine? Do anybody out there in the live audience, I'll, I'll cover grenades and I'll come back to it to give you a chance. How does one in the United States of America today procure a machine gun, fully automatic gun, and a suppressor? How do you do that? I'll let you guys tell me because it. Tom says FFL. It's a little more, but yeah, it's a tax stamp. It's a tax stamp. In a, well, I shouldn't have to. I agree, but we talked about using the system. And Chad says form a trust. And that's just another way of holding the stamps that allow you to have these, these these this stuff so that you can transfer it to your heirs or let other people use it without causing a problem for yourself. And the people that I know that have suppressor stamps and have uh, fully automatic weapons always hold them in trust if they're full on switched on as to all the things we just talked about. But th the thing that I knew would be like, you're trying to break it because you you want to create an excuse for yourself. So, oh, I want to own grenades. And I'm like, I and I said to this guy, I knew Twitter would be the place where somebody would be like, I want grenades and nuclear bombs. And he's like, you're supposed to be an anti you know, purity test. You're supposed to be an anarchist. Are you anti grenade? I didn't even bother to respond. I felt like saying, shut your face, slit. And I just said, all oh, the purity test, complete idiocy. And that was it, the end of the discussion. So do I think you should be able to own a hand grenade? I think you should be able to own an F-16 if you have the money and you want to, as long as you're not hurting anybody with it. But we're working within the confines of the matrix today, folks. So if you really want to own grenades, you can own grenades. I guarantee you, you can find someone on the black market to sell you grenades. I guarantee you, you can figure out how to make your own grenades. You're also taking risks. You're taking risks that you will go to jail prison really forever, right? You're taking risks that you will blow yourself up. Every single thing we do comes with risk. I have decided the risk of being able to own a hand grenade outweighs for me the advantage of owning a hand grenade. And if, if, if I don't know that I would own hand grenades if it was totally legal. I don't see the hand grenade for me being a very practical defensive weapon or even offensive weapon in the world in which we live. Right. Not opposed to you necessarily owning one, but doesn't make sense for me. And what has happened is all of these people that say shit like this and and, and, and Mitchell saying he's sketchy. And yeah, it could be a Fed. I, 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 I doubt it in this case because I kind of know who this guy is. Um, but yeah, I 
I, that's just and and this is the thing where I was going with it. We, a lot of this shit that I can't, they won't let me, etc. No, it's always the case that you've made a decision based on how hard it is, how much it costs, and what the risk associated with it is. You don't want to take the risk, or you don't want to do the work. So you'll try to pull something out that's completely ridiculous. I want to own my own country. You know, well, go found one. Give it a shot. I don't know. Maybe you'll succeed. Maybe you'll. I don't know. But when in the world of reason, we can do things. And so the automatic weapon or the suppressor, if that's what you really want, like the suppressor is two hundred dollars and waiting six months. Well, I shouldn't have to, but you could have done it six months ago and you'd already have it. Right. I mean, it's it's absolutely ridiculous that somebody will say, I want to be able to do a thing. And the system literally has a path for you to do the thing. You refuse to take it and then say the system prevents it. Uh, and I just wanted to say a little on that, because I know there's people that are going to when I I'm going to ask here in just a second. If I'm going to ask now. As I go through some stuff about sustainable development that I pulled from yesterday's show, what do you want to do? And how can it be done? I would, if you have something you want to do that you feel impeded by, and I will not, I promise I will not beat you up for it. You're in the live chat. Please put it in all ca ca caps now. I'll start and we'll come back and I'll throw some ideas at it. Um, but yesterday we did a show on sustainable development. And a few people said that the guests talked more about their history in life than they did about how to do the thing. And to a, to a point, I, I do agree. And I did kind of push toward like, let's get into this development. And, and I think that maybe we could have gotten more from it if we would have focused more on the actual development that was being done. But I still gained a ton from it. I gained a ton from it. And this would be some of the three, like three main bullet points that I, that I gained from this. And this is true in all types of things, not just the sustainable real estate development. There are marketing words and there are legal words. So part of status jiu-jitsu is knowing which words to use. So if I was doing a sustainable development built on permaculture principles, right? You know, a permaculture based community, a uh, planned community with a permaculture farm on it. Those are all great ways to phrase it as a marketing thing, assuming there's enough people that know what permaculture is in your market that you're targeting. But I would never use that on a legal document. Or when going to a planning community or when going to an insurance company. Here's an example. Back when we did Perma Ethos, we knew we needed insurance for the farm. So when the insurance adjuster asked one of the partners, what does the farm, what is this business? He said it's a permaculture farm. It immediately became impossible to get simple insurance. They didn't know what to do. And so they finally they're like, Jack, we can't get insurance. I'm like, well, tell me what's going on. So Kevin told me what's going on. I'm like, go back and tell him we have an organic farm. And Kevin's like, but it's a permaculture farm. I'm like, does a permaculture farm do not meet the definition, at least, of organic farming? He's like, yeah. And I'm like, why don't you just go tell him we have the hell with organic? We have a farm. You see what I'm saying there? You don't use, like, niche words when you're dealing with the state, here's another example. If you put swales on your farm, you don't tell the government you put swales on your farm. You tell the government you installed USDA Code 600 agricultural terraces. Do you know why you do that? Because the USDA calls a swale a USDA Code 600 agricultural terrace. They're literally the same thing, different names. Why do you do this? One, because your guy from NCRS doesn't know what a swale is. They start asking questions where if you use a USDA Code 600 agricultural terrace, you follow paperwork with NRCS and the USDA, and they give you money. Because you, exactly, you can get grants for that. That's what Dennis Allen is saying. All of a sudden, by changing the words, I get a grant. And I know the purest libertarians are like, you're taking the government's money. Yes, I am. I will take all the money I can get from the government because they constantly steal from me. When I get to zero, we can talk about it, and I still know they're going to keep stealing from me. I need a net negative to stay ahead. I will take all of it. I will take all of it. I will take all of it. Militant Roots, he might be that one of the grenade. He said, yeah, I'm definitely a Fed. I don't know if you're a Fed or not, but if you're the grenade dude, you're trying to break it because you're making an excuse 
for not accomplishing what you want to accomplish either way. Yeah, Joe Tippett says, don't hate money. So we have to be very careful with the words we choose to use, depending on who we're interacting with. So if I go to a planning committee, right, a zoning and planning committee, and they say, well, what are you going to do? We are integrating a fully natural permaculture planned community. And my dress is made of wheat, right? You know, like that, right? Like this hippie shit. No, it's not going to play here. You even go to hippie town zero. It still probably won't play there because these are all stuffed shirts. They're all worried about things being messed up. But if you go in and you use words like the World Economic Forum would use, you're still doing your thing. We're doing a well-planned out ecological community with organic farming integrated into our community. And I wouldn't even say community, subdivision. We want to we want to put in a uh, a sustainable subdivision that integrates organic farming right in the backyard. And maybe that's not the way. Natural gardening. Maybe they don't want farming. Oh my God, that's scary. It's farming. That's commercial. No, it integrates organic gardening. Is there a limit on how big a garden could be? You know, if you employ the right consultant, which is something our guest said yesterday that you might have missed, then they know what words to use. So it's understanding the right words need to be used. And then when you're in over your head, finding the people that know what the right words are and paying them to do it for you. Right? That's that's how you take this approach. So use marketing words and legal words where they belong if you were doing a sustainable development. And this is more than just that. Um, the next thing is you really say it this way, but if you go into a community where there's maintenance performed by a third party on a regular basis that you don't pay for one-on-one -on -one with a direct bill, there's going to be what you would think of as a POA or HOA expense. There's going to be a cost. You basically have private property taxes with an HOA or a POA. Is this bad? I don't know. Is there a way that it's controlled so it can't get out of hand? And does it protect the right of the property owner versus obstruct the right of the property owner? When I lived in Arkansas, our property had what was called a neighborhood covenant, right? A neighborhood covenant. And this was set in stone. It took 100% of the people that lived there to change it. Not 99, 100% had to change it for it to change. And there was a few things that it prevented from happening. One was subdividing under a certain size lot. Uh, one was, you know, you had to have like a real roof on the house. There's one other thing. And I was like, I'm fine with all that. Okay. And see, here's where people, this is where you lose control of your brain. ESGHOA. No. If you're designing the HOA, the HOA does what you want. Now, might it be good that a zoning and planning commission would see it as an ESGHOA? Well, that might be great. They think they're going along with Agenda 2030. That's fine. This is my little fiefdom I'm creating. I'll use whatever freaking words, right? Whatever freaking words they need to hear, as long as it doesn't prevent me from doing what I want to do. People holding their breath. I'm back to, do you want to be right or do you want to be happy? And if you do things correctly, you can be right and happy. But if you can't be happy, you're never going to be right with yourself. So what if, this is this is where I was going with this, what if the HOA fees were actually a co-op fee that paid a farmer or small group of farmers to do all of the things that need to be done on a daily basis? So because maybe calling it a co-op will blow the whole deal, even though that's how you're going to run it. Even though that's how you're going to run it. Maybe calling it an HOA that operates like a co-op, including returning dividends back to uh, stakeholders who are property owners so that eventually their HOA fees can be very low or go to zero or actually have a net positive refund to them. And maybe, maybe instead of actually refunding the money in cash, they would end up with a book, like a credit on a, on a, on a ledger, so that the co-op could go out and buy things that the members could use their credit to procure, like all the supplies and stuff that they need. So that there's no transfer of funds back and forth and no tax consequences in that because they basically are just a stakeholder in the system. And there is there is a tax consequence, but it's very singular and easy to, to sort out. And it also would be quite 
easy to prorate expenses across the board and devalue it. And you have that all going through one central point. Centralization isn't always bad. And my thing with stuff like this is the rules must be very, very difficult to change. The rules must be very, very clear. And everybody going into the agreement must understand the rules when they enter the agreement. It shouldn't be 87 pages of bullshit. <clears throat> it should be something anybody with like a 10th grade education can read, comprehend, and understand. And that way, if you don't like it, you don't go there. And if you don't like it and you don't go there, you don't bitch, you go do it yourself. Because there's so many people, they always want to bitch about what somebody else is doing. They don't really like talks like I'm giving today because the talk that I'm giving today puts the emphasis on you for you to do the thing that you keep talking about and to remove the excuses. And then, you know, that leads me to what would an anarchist HOA look like? Could there be an anarchist HOA? Could that exist? Because people think, well, no, HOAs are always... So HOAs are vomit, in my opinion, in the way that they exist. But I've always said there would be a place... If you created a true anarchist world, then the key to happiness would be HOAs. See, right now, the way HOAs are applied is they're another layer of government on top of multiple layers of government. So let's say you live within city limits and you have an HOA. So now you have federal law, you have state law, you have county law, you have city law, and you're like, you know what? Screw that shit. This is not enough government for me. Gotta be harder, daddy. We need an HOA. But what the HOA did was spell out, you don't get, to bluntly, you don't get to fuck with your neighbor, period. Understand that before you buy this house, Karen, go buy, go out and buy another house. Then that would be very anarchist, even in the current system. If you remove the state, or you remove most of government into a minarchism, HOAs would serve a completely valid purpose for self-determination. So people that lived over here could decide when they did their development, which would be very easy to do because there's nobody telling them that they can't do it, that they could set up there and they would attract the people that are like them. And then we would have good fences, good neighbors. And the fences would be agreed upon restrictions. We do our shit over here. You do your shit over there. Goodbye, go out. It seems like a pretty good way to live. And the person has a problem with it. You're as bad as the person you're bitching about. You're See, this is what I've always said. If you don't have liberty for every, everybody, you don't really have liberty for anyone in the end. I Because the main thing that people use governments for is because they don't like what somebody else is doing that doesn't affect them. You have basic law enforcement that most people, even if we'd like to see it done a different way, agree with. Guy breaks into my house, a couple guys in some costumes come, grab his ass and throw him in a cage. I think most people are okay with that. Again, that doesn't mean that system doesn't get misused. That doesn't mean that that system doesn't have problems. But in the end, if the guy literally is the guy that broke into your house and stole your shit, and assume you didn't lay him out and give him a dirt nap, if he gets thrown in a cage for a while because of what he did, most people are okay with it. Somebody goes up and physically harms somebody and there's a consequence for it, they're okay with it. Outside of that, though, most of law enforcement, like, I want to make this substance illegal. So this person over there is using a substance. All you have to do is not pay attention, but you want the state to do what you can't do, control your own attention. Well, what if they get high on meth and steal my TV? Okay, then they're going in the cage. And maybe we'd have time to put them in the cage if we weren't worried about the people using the substance that weren't bothering you. Instead, we spread law enforcement out on all your little emotional freaking baggage bullshit, enforcing your religion, your spirituality, your personal beliefs. To me, the way you would handle an HOA is say none of that shit plays here. Of course, we have to comply with state, local, federal, whatever law. Of course we do. Don't want to? Got it. We set that up and we did that. Basically, your HOA would be no further incursions. It might also be, well, how is a problem handled? You agree, you agree if you live here, if there's a problem to use internal moderation before you go to the state. That would be another, like, that doesn't mean that the internal moderation is binding. But it's amazing how quickly, because I've had many contracts I've drafted in my life with business relationships. And I've had a few conflicts. And every single one of them required non-binding arbitration prior to any binding arbitration of any sort. I never got to any binding arbitration. I only once got to a non-binding non arbitration. And it immediately kind of deflated everything and we both agreed to a thing and then we went on with our lives. Most of the time, the fact that the non-binding arbitration exists and is a requirement to go to the next level, alone will make both sides kind of look at it and go, how do we work this out? 
So you you would you would design your community your way, and I mine, but I would honestly design all lots to not touch each other. I would have common space that is pathways and spaces and food and trees and something, ponds, canals, whatever. So the two people never share a fence. Right there, you eliminate 90% of the problems neighbors have. You ever notice you almost always inevitably have a problem with a neighbor that borders your property and you almost never have a problem with a neighbor that's even two doors down, let alone five? The fence needs fixing. Well, we got to split the cost. I don't have money. So then you buy a fence and you feel pissed off or whatever, right? What if the person says, I don't want a fence. You're the one with a dog. You're the one with a goat, whatever. Like that would be one of my, but you design it your own way. Let's go through some stuff that people have commented on again, even though I'm already doing that. If you put your stuff in all caps, I'll come back and take a look at it. Um, I think this is Mickey. And he said from, this is from when I was talking about forming your own LLC. He says, this is how I operate. My company is MF Automation LLC, not Mickey Franks. It's also set up as an S Corp with both my wife and 12 year old as an employee. So that's interesting. It's a dual structure. And if you're still there, Mickey, does one exist within the other or do they exist totally separately? So you can have, for instance, an LLC within it hold an S Corp or the other way around. So one company can own another company. And that's that's an advanced strategy, but it's often a good one. Uh, Often a split design is well uh, will work. Uh, For instance, one of the things you can do if you have a a split design or even an inside design and you were uh, bidding on a governmental contract, you might get preferential uh, uh, selection for being a minority owned company. Even though women outnumber men, the federal government and many state governments consider a woman owned company a minority owned corporation. So if you gave your wife 51% of the corporation and you were bidding on a minority contract, that would be an example of something that I know multiple parties who have done right here in the state of Texas, and it's worked well for them. Um, A.J. Anderson says, your tax and law professionals are also tax deductible. Yeah, here's what's interesting, though. The money you will pay them this tax cycle, you deduct in the next tax cycle. That's just just something to to know. It doesn't really, they'll they'll tell you that, but yeah, that's kind of funny that it works out that way. Uh, Eka Mouse, and Eka Mouse says, if you're watching this video and you haven't hit like, you are in trouble. Do not get the wrath of the Eka Mouse. She says, USD code 600 improvement, face plant not swales. I have done a wee bit of that. Yeah, yeah. If you are on a, a agriculturally zoned property, large enough to qualify for grants, and there, this is something else people really need. Like there are so many people that literally they hold their breath and stick their fingers in the air. Whenever you hear about the interactive edge with the state, you, you need to learn the definitions of words before you act like a spoiled child. When somebody uses them, it makes me think of last time I had Paul Wheaton on, I was explaining why if I had a resident on my property who was like an intern for my farm and I had a tiny house, even if I was willing to let them be there, that I would rent it to them through Airbnb, even if it was like 10 bucks a week or something. And he was like shaking his head and no, like not listening. I don't want to hear until he finally shut up long enough for me to say, because if they're a problem and I want them off my property, they're not a tenant and I can have them removed in an instant. It's like, oh, so don't let words cause you to shut your mind down because it's the surest way to make sure you don't find a solution. So here's an example with the Code 600 thing on the, the swales that are actually terraces and the government's vernacular. Grants are not subsidies. Grants are, they give the money to you. And there's sometimes conditions like for the next three years, this has to remain seeded or planted a certain way or not planted or unaltered. But then they go away and you're done with it. It's money and done. And again, anybody that tells me that it's unlibertarian or unanarchist to take money from programs from the government, Unless you are a non-tax paying person, which is almost impossible to get money like that, like we're talking about today, if you are, then fine. But let, let me say something about taxes, too. I do not differentiate between governments when it comes to thievery. So I pay property tax on this place. I put that in the same bucket as far as thievery and what the state has taken from me is I do federal income tax or Social Security. I know it went to different places. I know different thieves did it. But in the end, in my accounting, on my ledger, 
my net loss versus net gain, government took this money. Until my number balances out, which it never will, it will never balance. I will always have more taken from me than I get back. Until it goes to zero, I will take every penny I can get. Of course I will. Why wouldn't I? It's their game. They created it. I want a different game. But you gave me this game. In other words, I like playing soccer a lot better than I like playing basketball. I'm actually a damn good soccer. I'm probably not anymore because I'm old fart now with, with leg injuries. But I was a damn good soccer player when I was a kid. Really good. Like, I, I played on in, in a youth soccer club that was like 1% of kids in the Jacksonville, Florida area ever uh, got to play on it. And so I liked soccer a lot. And in soccer, a lot of people don't know this. You can hit people if you do it the right way. There's a way to check people. You can knock the shit out of people in soccer. Yeah, as far as I know, you're not allowed to do that when you're playing, let's say, basketball. So if I agree to play basketball, I'm not as good at it, but I don't get to bring soccer's rules into basketball, right? Because I agreed to play the game. So if you're operating within the state's apparatus, you've agreed to play the game. You didn't agree not to cheat. You didn't agree not to rape the rules to shit. But you did agree to exist within the confines of that higher level of matrix. And so, yeah, I'll take it all. And I, I always laugh when people say they won't. Uh, site leveler says, can we use an HOA and private clubs along with the gated community? Of course you can. You know what I love about gated communities? It's, it's, it's less likely that people come in and look that don't belong there. Well, I'm sorry, sir. Uh, do you have an appointment? Are you a member or a guest of a member? I'm sorry, sir, you're not allowed in. But I'm a cop. Did somebody call you? No? Okay. Do you have a warrant? No. And you're not a member or a guest of a member? Hmm. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But I'm a property inspector. Well, you'll have to call our office to make an appointment. And at least that way, even if you have to let them in, you control the access. You know how much shit happens because some asshole from, like, property assessment or somebody... Code enforcement comes by and writes bullshit up because they're bored. If you, it, It's not that they can't get in. If you just make it more inconvenient, the average person that does this job, you think they're a hardworking, dedicated employee? Or that you think there's somebody like, if I don't have a few violations written up this week, my boss is going to yell at me. You know the number one goal when you work in a bureaucratic system like that? Not to have your boss hear your name from his boss. You do that, your goal, you will retire with, with gold stars. If your boss's boss never brings your boss your name. So I'm Jack, I work for Bill, Bill works for Tom. If Tom never comes to Bill and says, we have to talk about Jack, I'm golden. So all I want to do is tick the boxes until retirement. Well, that one's hard and this one's easy. I'll go, this guy's fence. Got my protractor out. He's leaning at 13 degrees. That's a violation on his door. Doesn't mean you'll never have a problem. Just less problems. Uh, Eka Mouse also says, another gem this session. I'm on a board of directors for a co-op working on the funding aspect, doing shares, but now have another jewel to offer folks who join our co-op self-funding and area improvements. Of course. The, the, the definition of a co-op. Right. And you can you can back end a co-op into a development. You just don't want to go to a zoning and planning commission asking to put in a subdivision and use those words. Once it's in place, then it's just a structure that exists for the benefit of your members. Here's the definition of a co-op. It's owned and run by members for the benefit of members. And it has to be that. It doesn't mean you can't do business outside. So a co-op in a sustainable development could own several tiny houses. And then what you would do to totally make it kosher, if you, as a member of the co-op, want to rent, well, you already live there. Why would you want to rent a tiny house? Maybe your neighbors or your, uh, your brother-in-law is coming in from out of town. You get preferential booking and you get a discount. Now it's run for your benefit and it's run by you. And you get a say-so in it. And see, now we can do that but if you use that word when you approach a zoning and planning commission, I'm telling you right now, you are not getting permission. You're just not. 
Uh, let's see. Trevor says, hey, Jack, what are some benefits of being an ordained minister? I know a couple, but haven't pulled the trigger yet on any downsides. There's no downsides, and there's no reason not to pull the trigger. Go to ULC rate, uh, ULC.org right now, fill out a form, and you'll be an ordained minister. And then it's up to you, like anything else, to figure it out. You can buy shit from them for a couple bucks, like press passes and parking passes and stuff like that, and you can figure that out. The primary benefit that I see in this is one, having the credential, and two, notifying people that you have the credential. Like most people that know me know I am an ordained minister. I even got all the credentials and everything like that, but you don't really have to. Like literally you can do it on the internet right now. You could have already done it from the time I started talking about this. And you get into an area where if you were, somebody was talking to you about a thing, and then you were questioned by the state about the thing they talked to you about. If it's your spouse, you can say, you can't ask me because they're my spouse, unless they're like an active fugitive or something like that. Like there is some spousal privilege. Well, there's also ministerial privilege. I'm sorry, I cannot discuss this issue with you. If Mr. Smith talked to me about that all, and I'm not saying he did, but if he had, he would have come to me in the confidence as a minister. Right. Um, it, it, it is just here. Here's how I feel about this. It is so easy and so simple to do. There might be a benefit to you that you don't know about in the future. So you should have already done it. There is no downside to becoming a minister and it doesn't take any money. You can do it right now. Again, you could have done it two or three times at the time I talked about it. J.D. Draft says it's amazing how often the fence ends up being put up by one neighbor on the other neighbor's property. Used to work as a land surveyor for my dad and saw that a lot. Yeah. And this could cause problems where there shouldn't be any. My great uncle Pete and his neighbor, his, la his last name was Debsky. And these were, they. we went back, our families went back to when our families came to America from the Ukraine through Romania. All right. That's, that's how far back they went. So this should not have been this animosity. There was a rock wall, like stacked rock wall fence between their properties. And they argued, and they never even had a survey to figure out who was right, about 10 feet. And they would wait until the other one had kind of forgotten about it for a while because neither one of them even really went to that part of their property much. And one would literally move the rocks and rebuild the wall where they thought it belonged. And they did this to each other for years, for years. And no one could stop them. And we eventually decided, you know, it's two old guys moving rocks back and forth. Let them go. Until they start pointing guns at each other over, just let them go. And it, it is one of those things that would be better off if we could just avoid the problem in the first place. And I, I get sharing a fence line because if I share a fence line, then I, I, I cut my cost of fence maintenance in half. But if we built fences to be lifetime fences, that would matter. And if we always see one of the problems with a fence line, when you live in suburbia, this isn't an issue. But like for me with my neighbor in my back, I have all his trees and shit growing into my fence. And I'm going to end up having to go over to him and say, look, man, I'll pay for it. But somebody needs to do something about that. I don't have time to do it. And I'll have to pay like a tree company and would come in and basically clear the fence line. If the fence line to my neighbor has an easement between it and a five foot or four foot, whatever the cut of a standard lawnmower is, I just run my lawnmower around the fence a couple times a year. And I don't ever have that happen. All little tree seedlings, they should get cut to the ground. Very, very simplistic. So if we started, if I did a community, I would like really want to encourage things like living fences, you know, using the right climate, using hazelnut or willow. There's probably something for every climate. Or if we're going to do a fence, let's do something that's permanent. Let's do rock. Let's do concrete. Let's do something that's not going to need to be stained every two years. Now, I don't want to tell somebody they have to, but there's a lot of ways to encourage people to do things by pointing out the benefit to them and maybe helping them get it done. Or helping them reduce costs. You know how you reduce costs? You form a co-op and you buy in bulk. See, all this stuff plays together. All of this stuff's holistic. And, and this is the way people have to really start looking at this stuff is how do we holistically put this stuff together? How do we stop seeing things as independent from each other? Right? I want to do a farm. I want to do swales. But what I really want to do is raise cattle. Well, how many programs in NRCS can I take advantage of to get that done on this piece of land? I want to own my property outright because I believe the lie of the pride of ownership. And I don't understand tax law at all. And literally, I could be using debt to finance my farm and paying tens of thousands of dollars a year less than taxes, even if I'm servicing debt to the point where the interest rate is meaningless. But out of spite, I don't want to do that. 
right? You have to look at all how it blends together because there's two kinds of farmers, bankrupt ones and profitable ones. Non-profitable farms become bankrupt farmers. There's two types of housing developments, profitable ones and bankrupt ones eventually. Two types of business owners, profitable ones and bankrupt. There's, it's a dichotomy, guys. There's a, You either make a profit or you go under and you get destroyed. So when we don't look at it holistically and see how all the parts play together, we're heading for the second option, which is not good. Especially if we're doing something like a development where people we're selling to are counting on us to not screw it up. It's a lot of responsibility. With that, I want to remind you guys that there's quite a few ways you can help support this show. I'm going to give you a real easy one right here. And I'm going to say, if you don't do this one, you kind of hate money. And that is use the freaking fold card, guys. Get the fold card. There's a link in the video notes below. There will be a link in today's audio notes where you can find this page I'm showing you right now. But you can earn Bitcoin on literally everything you buy, spending money that you're going to spend anyway. And if you sign up with my fancy little link right there that I'm showing you, you'll get 5,000 free sats that when you do. So you can literally go from zero to being a Bitcoiner just by signing up absolutely for free. If you get the card, it's 10 bucks a month or $100 a year. If you're paying any any significant amount of your bills that are payable with a, with a Visa card uh, with it, you will get your money back many times over in Bitcoin. I've also been asked about this, like, well, why is that better? And I've already talked about how to game it. And that link I just gave you has all kinds of ways to game it. Like I just got 6% back on my Amazon purchases for this month, for instance, in Bitcoin. But how does it compare to something like a card that's just a cash back card? You know what you do with cash back on your credit card? It lowers your bill when you pay your bill and it's like it never happened. Sure, you have more money, but in the end you spend it. When you get Bitcoin, when you get Bitcoin, guess what you get? You get money that you keep because eventually you, you, you withdraw it from your fold account, you put it in cold storage and it's forever money. So that's why I like it encourages savings. The other way you can help support this show is what? Do your online shopping at tspaz.com. I don't have a new item of the day for you guys. I will tomorrow. I'm still recommending the book, The New Wild by Fred Pierce, because today's show, if you didn't get it, was all about pattern recognition, harnessing and channeling pattern. And one of the things that you will have to be able to do to truly unplug from the matrix is to be able to recognize the pattern in which you are lied to by seemingly uh, legitimate organizations. Like as much as I distrusted a lot of things that came out of science and technology, until recent events, I still thought at their core that they were doing the best that they can. And now I realize it doesn't matter where you're at in science and medicine. It's all driven by grants and all the grants do is create lies. I should have known this because I used to work in the world where we, we had a lot of interaction with like venture capitalists and stuff. And anybody that writes a proposal for a venture capitalist writes what the VC wants to hear, not what's really going on. And that's when you're when you're everything you do is funded by scientific grants and universities and things like that. You're going to do what you're told. And it's important. It's important. Very important. That if you're going to do things like this, you hold on. I got to block a, a spammer here. Block user. All right. We go. We don't need your Tinder crap here. Um, that you understand how to recognize these patterns. Because if you don't, you will never build the holistic system we talk about. So I really think reading that book would be a good education in recognizing the pattern that is used by government and authority and private industry through pseudoscience to build a case for things that are absolutely untrue. And many people, again, think that book is a panacea. It says you can just do whatever you want with invasive species and not worry about it, no consequences. Absolutely not. It gives both sides of the coin, but it does pr pragmatically and logically. And we could do a little more pragmatism and logic in our world today. Uh, so definitely do your online shopping starting at tspaz.com and consider uh, getting that book. Also consider being an MSB member. Uh, somebody said that they're a good spin on fold paid for their membership for a year. I've, I've lost that comment. Uh, Dennis Allen says, I love and use fold. Can't find another comment. Somebody said it. Um, Eka Mouse says, woot, third gem, BC for anything. Yep. That's through anything, anything. If you're saying Bitcoin for anything, that's that's what I'm saying. Anything you can pay for with a Visa card, a Visa debit card, uh, you can pay for with the Fold card. And it's totally worth setting up. Anyway, guys, with that, we have wrapped things up. Tomorrow we'll have a Q&A show. 
uh, with expert counsel. I've got all the expert uh, segments already picked out for tomorrow. It's going to be a great show. Uh, Dr. Ron Paul will be on, as always. Uh, and many other members of the expert council will be hearing from John Pogliano uh, on real estate. Uh, we will be hearing from Tim Toolman Cook on headlamps, a bunch of other cool stuff. And I will have a fantastic quote of the day for you that has to do with war and cowardice. And you'll just have to wait to hear what that is. I will catch you guys tomorrow with another episode.